Hi, I'm Carolyn Evans Hammond and welcome to my tasting room. Carolyn's Tasting Room is where you can taste exciting wines with me. And this week we taste four smart value summer sippers so you can drink better and spend less. Even with prices rising all around us, we still don't have to spend a lot to get a great tasting wine. We just need to know which bottles to buy. So today's flight, all from Italy, include the 2021 Botter Oggi Pinot Grigio della Venezi DOC, the 2022 Citra Sestina Pecorino Terra de Chieti IGT, the 2022 Castle Thalero Merlot Cabernet Sauvignon Terra de Chieti IGT, and the 2018 Nier de Citra Montpulciano de Bruzzo DOC. Let's taste. The first wine in our flight is a Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio is wildly popular all year round, but especially in the summer. And people like it because it's clean, neutral, refreshing, easy, versatile. And that's everything we've got here. But this is a DOC version, which means it's made to certain quality standards, despite not being very expensive. This sells for about $7 in the US and about 12 in Canada. So it will keep your budget in check. So pour yourself a glass and let's taste it together. You'll notice a color, pale, pale. I mean, it's, you know, see that straw hue? It's pale straw rather than golden. That's because it's stainless steel fermented. Most stainless steel fermented wines are not golden or yellow. And that's the case here. Pinot Grigio is also meant to be, you know, really clean and refreshing. So you don't, you don't see wood in it. Give it a swirl and a sniff. Restrained. Not a lot of aromas there, but it's clean. The fruit expression is clean. There's nothing off-putting. Maybe a touch of pear, apple, lemon. So clean, bright, crisp fruit, which is exactly what we want. Mm. And let's have a sip. Mm. Sweeps in, bright, refreshing immediately quenching. This is a vivid, vivacious style of wine. It's bone dry, you can tell, but it's not going to, you know, interfere with anything you pour with it. So it's not in your face flavor. There's restraint, there's venosity, but what its charm is, is that it's so well balanced. Um, let's have a sip and focus on what that looks like. So take it apart technically to see why it tastes so good. Have a sip, we're gonna focus just on the tip of the tongue to see if we're detecting any residual sugar. That's the best place to look for sweetness. No, it's dry, but it's not bone dry. There's actually four grams per liter of residual sugar, which is next to none. It's really just a sprinkle to round it out, polish it up. And you detect it a little bit on the tip of the tongue when you do that. But when you have a sip, it tastes bone dry. So love that. Very well balanced. Now we're going to focus on the sides of the palate. Um, let the wine wash in and see how, mo how much our mouth waters. Notice that? Almost eye watering. It's very high in acid. And that acidity works so well for a Pinot Grigio because it's quenching. And in the summertime, you chill this down, you have it and it's pure refreshment. And that's the acidity. But the acidity is not shrill because it's so well balanced with everything else in the wine, which means even though the fruit stuffing is not forward, it's not fruity, it's still tightly coiled. There's lots of it and that's a mark of quality. And we know that because the acid isn't standing out nor is the alcohol. The 12% alcohol is not showing through as heat in the back of the palate, even on the finish. And that's why we know this is a well-balanced, well-made, good quality wine. Let's have one more sip. See how it's expressing itself and see how long it is. The flavors are less about pear, which we found on the nose, and more about green apple and citrus, sort of lemon zest maybe a hint of lime, and on the finish, it's still there, but then it's gone. So it's sort of short to medium length, keeps you sipping, 
lovely a hint maybe of minerality on the finish which is nice it's often found in Italian Pinot Grigios because of the terroir um, and I think it's a great value good quality summer zipper And the second one in our flight is a Pecorino. Pecorino is an indigenous grape variety grown in Italy. It has grown there a long time, but it, um, you know, it's faded out and now it's experiencing a bit of a renaissance, especially in the Abruzzo region, which is where this wine comes from. Last 20 years or so, it's become, you know, quite fashionable to grow and now we get to taste one. So pour yourself a glass. Notice the color, it's a little deeper, a little, little deeper in color than the Pinot Grigio, but this too is stainless steel fermented, so there's no wood. We won't be looking for that. So we'll be getting a very sort of transparent expression of Pecorino, which is great. So it's clear and bright, which means it's stable. You have a swirl and a sniff. Now it's interesting, it's not really pronounced. This is not highly aromatic you know, like Sauvignon Blanc or Riesling or something like that. It's a little more restrained, but there's, there's the fragrance of pineapple. Do you notice that? That is classic for Pecorino, certainly for my nose. Almost like a green pineapple, like it's not terribly ripe, but it's there. I like that. Not wildly complex, but fresh and clean. Hmm. So have a sip, let the wine sweep in, and let's just experience it before we piece it apart. Lovely, isn't it? Clean, fresh, not quite as vertical as the last one. A little bit more broad, but this is a high acid grape. Pecorino is notoriously high in acid, which keeps it fresh, palate cleansing, and perfect for summertime. But this also has breath, as I say. So it, it floods the palate and streams in as well as out. And you're getting, are you getting the pineapple? That's lingering on the finish too. There's more length here. And it's so fresh. It's not wildly complex, but let's get to that in a minute. Have a sip. We'll focus on the tip of the tongue to see if it's dry or sweet. Dry or sweet. A little bit of residual sugar but not a lot, um, just enough to, to smooth it out, but it tastes dry when you just drink it. So have a focus on the size of the palate to see if we can detect that acidity, acidity that we talked about that we know is there in the Pecorino fruit. Mm. Well, quite high acid, but you don't notice it because it's well balanced. Lots of fruit stuffing too, and no heat at the back of the palate, even though this is, um, glancing at the bottle, it's 13% alcohol. So it's a little weightier, a little bit more full body than the last wine. And you're getting that, that weight in the mouth. It's sort of like if you compare the last wine to skim milk, this is sort of 2% territory. So let's have another taste and just see how, how it's expressing itself and see if we can tease apart any more complexity other than that unequivocal taste of pineapple that we're getting. Mm. Are you getting pear? A little bit of yellow plum maybe? And a hint of, a hint of maybe honeysuckle, something like that. And on the very finish, I'm getting a creaminess, almost like a, a note of Chantilly cream, which is nice. It's, you know, it's not sharp. It's, it's, Quenching, but smooth and a little bit creamy or nutty or something, which is nice, like a raw nut like that. So this, I think, is a great wine to serve with food because there's more weight than the last one. It's a kind of wine you could pour with grilled chicken easily. You could also pour it with finger foods, cocktail style, like a, a handful of nuts or a nibble of cheese. And the third one in our flight is exciting because it's Cabernet Merlot that has seen no wood and is clean. I really like this wine. 
and it's inexpensive. This wine sells for about $12 in Canada and about seven in the US. So it's, you know, it's about the price of a song these days. So pour yourself a glass and let's taste. In the glass, you'll notice a color, great depth of color. It's quite dark. It's actually opaque in the center, which suggests concentration. Now Cabernet Sauvignon already has a quite thick skin, so it's always, always going to impart great color to a wine. But, um, but here we've got quite a bit of depth and you know Cabernet and Merlot are there but Cabernet only comprises part of the blend. So give it a swirl and a sniff. Now it's not wildly heady or aromatic. It's not going to be because it's red anyway but it can be heady and it's not the case here is it? It smells a little bit like you know, muddled black fruit dark fruit more than red fruit. Are you getting that? Black berries, black currant, black cherries, all the dark fruit, which is nice, but it's very clean. There's nothing off putting. There's no, you know, nothing off putting. It's a very pure and I like that. It's not easy to make, you know, a red wine with no, no wood and make it smell this good. And they've done it, especially at this price point. Lovely. So let's have a taste and just let it sweep in. Hmm. Isn't that nice? Ripe, smooth, delicious, supremely drinkable. You know, drinkability is one of those phrases that's sort of used a lot in the wine community right now because there's such a difference between something that you just want to drink and something that you just want to taste. You can think about a wine or you can drink it. And this is a kind of wine that you really, you don't want to think too much about. You just want to drink it because it's quenching, it's refreshing, it's easy, and it's delicious. We will though, because this is the tasting room, taste it technically. So have a sip, focus on the tip of the tongue, and let's see if it's dry or sweet. There is a little bit of sweetness, yes. Technically, there's six grams per liter which is not a lot, but what that does here is it rounds it out. And it's, it's the reason this tastes so palatable. It's so smooth. That's, you know, that's because the sugar is just polishing up that fruit and making it taste shiny, bright, glossy. It's nice. It makes it also something you can pour cocktail style. And it won't taste too austere, too dry. So have another sip. We'll focus on the sides of the palate to see how the acid is expressing itself. balanced, not sticking out at all. There is enough acid to balance the fruit stuffing, other technical components, the sugar, but it is not standing out. It's not a high acid wine, sort of medium and well balanced. Now this has 13% alcohol, so it's medium weight. Let's focus on the back of the palate to see if we're noticing any alcoholic heat. This is really important because, you know, when you're drinking in the summertime and you're drinking white wine, or sorry, red wine, you do not want it to be out of balance. It might get a little warm in the glass. You do not want the heat showing through at the back of the palate. You want enough fruit stuffing to blanket that. So let's focus just on the alcoholic heat. None at all, none. Love that, and the texture is plush, lush with a, a sheen on top. It's such a pleasure to drink. It's such a lovely wine for the money. And on the finish, it lingers, but it's still in the black fruit arena. It's a kind of wine you could pour with. I mean, that, you know, that black fruit, I think, goes really well with red meat. So a grilled steak, bang on. Burgers, yes, or meat alternatives. You could also pour this with sausages that would re work really well because it's a lighter bodied wine. It's medium bodied, so it's not going to coat the palate. And that lift, that spike of acidity that's balancing all those other components will work well with something like a juicy sausage. And the last wine in our flight is still affordable, but slightly pricier than the last three. It's $18 in Canada and $18 in the US, but I think it could sell for more. So it's a kind of wine you can bring to a party with confidence. It's a Montpulciano de Bruzzo, which is a red, 
Italian variety that I think you will really like. It's, it's a little bit more serious, a little bit fuller bodied, so let's taste. Pour yourself a glass. Notice the color. The color is deep, dark, you know, black almost. Give it a swirl and a sniff. See how much different it is in the last one? It's, it's heady. So this you've got, you know, more than just the fruit. You've got the dark fruit, yes, sort of dark cherry, but also chocolate, dark chocolate, a little bit of black olive maybe, roasted nut, almost burnt almond. So lots of deep, dark characters. This is a kind of wine that would go really well with grill marks, so it's deep caramelized juices of whatever you're putting on the grill. Um, very enticing, no? So let's have a sip. Beautiful. This tastes more serious. You know, yes, it's drinkable, but there's complexity as it fans out and cascades. Mm -hmm. So let's have a sip, focus on the tip of the tongue first to see if it's dry or sweet. Slightly drier than the last one, which had six grams per liter. This one has five. Little bit of sweetness, just enough to round it out, balance all the other components and make it taste seamless. That is a mark of quality and that's what every winemaker tries to achieve if they're doing the job well. They're trying to put all the components in perfect balance so when you drink it, it just tastes seamless. There might be texture from the tannins if it's red, but that, that textural component should be balanced with the other ones. And this one, I think, is velvety, which is great. So have a sip. We're going to focus on the sides of the palate and see um, how, how much your mouth waters. Balanced acidity. It's not high. It's not low. Perfect balance. Scrapes the palate clean and is in balance with the fruit stuffing. That mid-palate concentration here is quite ripe, quite lush. There's um, that velvetiness too. Do you notice that? Which is great. It holds the fruit in place on the finish and makes it very food friendly. It's the kind of wine you can, you know, you can pour with all sorts of things. But also, you know, grilled beef ribs would be amazing. So let's have another sip and we'll, um, we'll just see how it speaks to us in terms of its expression. We found lots on the nose. Let's see if it's expressing that way on the palate. Dark chocolate, dark cherry. Are you getting espresso bean? A little bit of mocha? Mm -hmm. I am. Even a little bit of like all sorts, like licorice, all sorts, a little bit of black olive, definitely freshly turned dark earth. So lots of complexity, complexity, concentration, and length of the three hallmarks of quality, more concentration here than you'd expect at this price point, and therein lies a value. And it's still lingering on the finish. My palate is left with a little bit of brininess, kind of like sucking on a black olive pit. Lovely. So lots of uh, lots going on here, lots of value. Now this is a wine that sells for, I said, $18 in Canada and about 18 in the US. And it's a kind of wine you can pour with confidence, but you can also gift it with confidence. So let's have one more sip, focus on the back of the palate. We do know by glancing at the label, it's 13.5% 13, 13 alcohol. So a bit more weighty, sort of the it's verging on full bodied, but still medium to full bodied, which is important in the summertime because if there's too much alcohol and you're pouring it on a hot summer night, it can taste a bit soupy. You don't want that. So let's have one more sip and we'll see if the alcohol is cloaked appropriately by the fruit and in good balance. Notice any heat? None here. And I'm pouring this at room temperature which you should, you know, you could pour it a little bit cooler um, in the summertime, but generally if you're having a glass in the sun, it's gonna be room temperature. And that alcoholic heat is nowhere to be found. Love that. So this is a great wine. You can pour it with all sorts of foods. You can gift it. And it's a great value summer sipper.
So there you have it, four Smart Value Summer Sippers, so you can drink better and spend less. Which wine did you like best? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe because I'm coming right back with another lineup of delicious wines here on Carolyn's Tasting Room.